The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Beginning this evening, the Cavalcade of America will bring you a series of four weekly musical half-hours featuring one of radio's distinguished conductors, Don Voorhees and his orchestra. This evening, the evolution of dance music in America. These programs, illustrating the development of interesting phases of American music, will be another chapter in the summer series of the Cavalcade of America in Music, presented by DuPont. An interesting feature of each program will be a brief story of chemical research, illustrating the DuPont phrase, Better things for better living through chemistry. dancing nation, from the days when the old fiddle concertina played for the rollicking barn dance to the present day with its hundreds of polished dance orchestras beating out their rhythms on roof gardens high up toward the clouds. Dance music of today gives us a smooth pattern of restful tone colors or a brilliant flash of rhythmic design, lights and shadows, a variety of arresting effects. Phonograph and radio have made the varying styles of different dance orchestras familiar to Americans from coast to coast. How did it all happen? Let us turn the calendar back to the 1880s and look in on an old-fashioned square dance to the tune of Turkey and the Straw. A new operetta opened. Victor Herbert wrote the music, and it was full of infectious melodies. One of them seems to typify the life that of that day and the perpetual popularity of that most romantic of all dances, the waltz. In old New York, remember it? But even then, the tempo of life was increasing. America was in a hurry to advance. The business panic of 1907 came unwent. That same year, the Lusitania made its maiden voyage, and the Merry Widow came to America from Vienna. The Nickelodeon movie house came into vogue. Bert Williams was in the Ziegfeld Follies, and women began to smoke. But the waltz was still the favorite dance. Sentiment was still the leading characteristic of the songs and spirit of the time. And then something happened. <laughs> organized in New Orleans in 1909, and it marked the beginning of dance music as we know it today. They played with gyrations. They shook, twisted, swayed. The listener's head was dizzy, but his feet understood and beat time. It was crude, perhaps, but its rhythm was arresting and its spirit catching. It had vitality and sincerity. It was peculiarly American. For some time, the Dixieland Jazz Band was not widely known. But in 1912 in New York, Something else happened. Irving Berlin, 
23-year-old songwriter of Tin Pan Alley, wrote Alexander's Rag and Band. Nothing like its syncopated jubilance had ever been heard before. Its new rhythm insinuated itself into the life of America with a bang. Shoulders started swaying. The lobster palace of Diamond Jim Brady fame came to an end, for every restaurant had to provide dance music with meals, and dining became incidental. The haunting strains of Alexander's ragtime band were heard everywhere. It was the song of the hour. The dance craze was on. <laughs> Alexander's ragtime band started it. America literally went dance crazy. It seemed as if no one could dance enough. Dance orchestras sprung up everywhere. Many strange variations in dance steps came into fashion. Turkey trot, bunny hug, grizzly bear, one step, fish walk, and fox trot. Two celebrities emerged from this dancing world. Irene and Vernon Castle, whose charm and graceful dancing made them idols of the day. Meanwhile, the Dixieland Jazz Band journeyed from New Orleans to Chicago, where the crowds went wild. From there to San Francisco, where they also created a sensation. But the Dixieland had never been to New York, and New York had never heard anything quite like it. And yet New York was supposed to set the style. The Dixieland Jazz Band finally came east and was engaged by Rice and Weber's Cafe. Let's look in at Rice and Weber's in New York on the evening when the Dixieland Jazz Band is to be introduced to New York for the first time. There's an unmistakable air of excitement and pleasant anticipation. Every table is filled, and mostly with celebrities. We hear a couple talking at one of the tables. Waiter, waiter, yes, please. Sir. This way, please. Table. Well, darling, isn't it about time for them to introduce the Dixieland Jazz Band? Yes, yes, they're coming on the stand now. I hear it's great music. Oh, I can hardly wait. Oh, I bet it's wonderful for dancing. Well, I hope so. I never saw such a turnout like yes? Every celebrity in town is here. Oh, look, look, the manager's going to make an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you the greatest dance music you've ever heard, the Dixieland Jazz Band, for its first appearance in New York. <laughs> these boys, these boys started something when they began several years ago in New Orleans. They went to Chicago, became the talk of the town, then San Francisco, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Rice and Weppers in New York. Get ready to dance, ladies and gentlemen, the Dixieland Jazz Band. <laughs> You're all there, and shall we dance? Well, no. No, wait a minute. I I don't want to be the first on the floor. Well, somebody has to start. Come on. Well, I don't know. I... I'm kind of scared. Well, anybody who likes to dance as much as you do, I... Yes, but I never heard music like this before. I wouldn't know how to dance to it. You wouldn't either. Well, I admit it. But look, there isn't a soul on the dance floor. Yeah, no one's even smiling. Oh, that's too bad. After all we've heard, and I, and I thought it would be such a success. Yeah. And everyone looks bewildered. Bewildered? Huh. Look at the manager. He looks as if he lost his last friend. Yes, he looks frantic. And you blame him. Ladies and gentlemen, please, you you don't understand. This is jazz. It, it's meant to be danced to. Try it and you'll see. Now, someone started. Please. I'll even dance myself. <laughs> All right, Here we go. All right, boys. Right, because the guests felt sorry for the manager. Maybe it was because someone laughed. Whatever it was, the crowd at Weiss and Weber's that night danced as they had never danced before. Jazz had hit New York, and New York loved it. While this was going on, something was happening out in California. A young man named Paul Whiteman had organized an orchestra and was playing at the Alexandria Hotel in Los Angeles. He believed that jazz was the soul of America, and he gave himself the job of taming it. 
refining it to bring out the beauty he felt sure was there. He and his orchestra came east for an engagement at the Ambassador in Atlantic City. They didn't cause much of a stir, and they might have packed up and gone home. A representative of the Victor Talking Machine Company hadn't happened to lunch at the Ambassador one day in 1920. Paul Whiteman was given a two-year contract to make Victor Records. And that was the beginning of a cyclonic series of happenings. New York and an engagement at the Valley Royal, the largest cafe in town. Pictures in the papers, theater engagements, fame. Paul Whiteman revolutionized jazz. It became a thing of beauty and charm, full of infinite variety. With it came a refinement of dance steps. The names that make news all flocked to the Valley Royal to hear the new jazz. In 1920, people everywhere were rolling back their rugs and dancing to Paul Whiteman's famous phonograph record of Whispering. <laughs> Whiteman set the pace, and dance music became steadily more musical and more interesting. Something was always happening. New rhythms and new dances were constantly springing up. Remember back in 1925? Orchestras began to produce soloists with individual styles, men such as Vic Spiderbeck on the trumpet. Eddie Lang on the guitar, and Joe Venuti on the fiddle, Miff Moe on the trombone, Frank Trumbar on the saxophone, Jack Teagarden, the Dorsey Brothers, Benny Goodman, our conductor Don Voorhees, and many others. They brought forth and popularized a new kind of rhythm, elusive yet fascinating. It was characterized by an easy swing and great spontaneity. Here's the way it sounded when the boys played Nobody's Sweetheart. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
1930. Sweet music. Maybe the late depression had something to do with it. So when the mad pace of 1929 eased down, dancers wanted their music slow and easy. Rudy Valley and Guy Lombardo arrived on the scene, and Ogie Carmichael's beautiful tune, Stardust, was the hit of the day. Then America borrowed a Cuban rhythm and made it one of the popular pastimes of the day, the rumba. Vincent Humans composed a new one called it the Carioca, and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers danced to it in the picture flying down to Rio. just what it is, but everybody recognizes it, and the followers of Swing are an ever-increasing number. Many people think it's new, but Swing has been with us a long time. It just wasn't called that until recently. There's a character of improvisation, but it follows definite patterns. The tune is Stompin' at the Savoy. Swing it, Don Boys.
one dance that is ageless, always in style. It was popular in the day of the polka and the square dance. It was unshaken by ragtime. It lived through the 1920s. And it's still a favorite in today's era of swing. For after all, what could be nicer than dancing to the strains of a beautiful waltz? Western Farm, which is the setting for our story of chemistry this evening. It is early spring, and Billy Bruce, son of the owner and a recent graduate of the State Agricultural College, is talking with his grandfather. <laughs> you and your newfangled ideas about chicken raising, hmm? Well, all right, Grandpa. If you don't believe my ideas are practical and won't even realize that they've been worked out and proved at college experimental stations, well, let's have a contest. Uh, a what? Contest. You know, when I get the new hat from the loser. Well, no, I could do with a new hat. Uh, what's your idea, Billy? Well, look. You take 100 of those new chicks and care for them your way, see? Yeah. The way you've always done. Yep, yep, I see. And I'll take 100 chicks and care for them the way I've been taught. Mm-hmm. And at the end of 12 weeks, we'll let a third person judge the chicks and decide who wins. <laughs> You're on, Billy. And uh, 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 make a note of my hat size, Seven and a quarter. (laughs) Grandpa did not win the hat. At the end of the 12 weeks, he had lost 18 of his chicks, and the 82 still living averaged only a pound and a quarter each and were unthrifty and poorly feathered. Billy lost only six chicks, and the 94 still living averaged about three pounds each. They were husky and well-grown. And Billy went right on with his newfangled methods to win a fall and winter contest, too. Caring for 100 laying hens the way he'd been taught, Bill got an average of 14 eggs per hen per month, while Grandpa got only seven. And a large part of Billy's success must be credited to chemical research. One of the modern scientific aids to poultry raising, which Billy used, is a non-breakable, semi-transparent window material made by coating wire screen with a plastic solution. DuPont's name for this product is cello glass. Unlike ordinary glass, cello glass permits the passage of ultraviolet rays from the sun, a vital factor in growth, health, and egg production. And that's why it is being used on well over a million farms today. But chicks aren't the only benefactors. If you have a garden of any kind, DuPont cello glass can help you outwit Jack Frost either in the spring or fall and get earlier, sturdier plants. Cello glass is also widely used for decorative lighting effects and in electrical signs and displays both indoors and out because it diffuses light and takes colored decoration so readily. It comes in rolls, is easy to handle, can't break like glass, yet provides warmth and light and gives protection from rain and snow. In fact, it's ideal for storm doors and storm windows in farm homes. If you own a farm or just have flower or vegetable gardens to care for, We suggest that you ask your garden supply, hardware, or lumber dealer 
about inexpensive DuPont cello glass. This product is only one of the numberless contributions that chemical science has made and is making to give us all, as DuPont expresses it, better things for better living through chemistry. Next week at the same time, the Cavalcade of America in Music, presented by DuPont, will bring you another program with Don Voorhees and his orchestra, this one to be the tuneful development of American musical comedy and operetta. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.